Liverpool Council resolved to declare a climate emergency. It also said it was going to call on Westminster to provide the powers and resources necessary to achieve the target for Cornwall to become carbon neutral by 2030 and commit to work with other councils with similar ambitions. It's also uh, uh, resolved to provide adequate staff time and leadership to prepare a report within six months to establish how Cornwall can reduce carbon emissions. And, and this report is, is to draw on the actions Cornwall Council has already and will continue to take and where possible outline partners' commitments to move towards carbon neutral Cornwall by 2030. So today, I'm here because I'm the Cornwall Council Cabinet Member with responsibility for the environment. But delivering on the Council motion is not down to me as an individual. It's incumbent on the whole Cabinet and Council across Council directives to act. It's a huge challenge, and that's for good reason. But at the highest levels, that challenge is accepted. Now, before we sort of get down to neighbourhood development uh, plans, I think we have to have some sort of understanding of the planning hierarchy, uh, which sort of starts at the national government uh, level uh, with the National Planning Policy Framework, which is often referred to as the NPPF. And that was revised last summer. It does contain ambitious policies on climate change, but on the ground delivery is slow. And that's thought largely because of the lack of practical advice and support to local councils on how to secure a radical reduction in carbon emissions. Now, following that publication of the NPPF, of the revised version, the Town and Country Planning Alliance produced a guide called Rising to the Climate Crisis, a guide for local authorities on planning for climate change. And I've just picked out a, a quote from that. It says, climate change is undoubtedly one of the greatest challenges faced by humanity. But we have the tools to respond effectively, and spatial planning is one of the most powerful. So, I obviously can't go too much into that document in the time I've got, so I would suggest people might like to find that guide on the Town and Country Planning Alliance website uh, because it is freely accessible there. So moving down to the next layer, you've got Cornwall's local plan, which was approved in 2016. And one of the plan's overarching objectives is to make the best use of our resources by reducing energy consumption while increasing renewable and low carbon energy production, maximising the use of pre previously used land, supporting local food production, and increasing resilience to climate change. So that's in the Cornwall Local Plan. <coughs> in considering renewable and low carbon energy, the supporting text states that given our aim to be a green peninsula, resilient to rising energy costs and with low carbon economy, a strong and achievable response to our climate change obligations is needed. This must strike a balance between wider sustainability and economic objectives, energy use and efficiency. So that's in the current plan. However, in, in light of the climate emergency motion, I, I've got people asking, should the local plan be updated? Now, the local plan is a statutory document and it can only be changed through a full statutory process. And that's a lengthy and expensive process that takes a minimum, and I mean a minimum, of, of three years and costs more than a million pounds and that's without officer costs. So, monitoring the plan is showing that we're delivering against its main targets. So, at this time, <coughs> We do, do not need to immediately instigate a formal update. And so in some ways that would probably be a distraction if we uh, went into that. But Cornwall Council does have to consider whether the local plan strategic policies need updating. It has to do that by 2021. The Council is now clear that we need to take a different approach when thinking about future growth in order to create a positive story for Cornwall. 
And it's hard for that statutory planning process to establish a long-term vision. And that's due to the rigidity of the process. I'm afraid a tendency to get stuck on housing numbers. So an alternative way is being suggested by our senior planners of adopting a more creative, positive and long-term approach to land management. Fundamentally, Cornwall Council want to start a dialogue capable of reaching a broader consensus of what future growth should look like. A concept for Cornwall called 50-50 is emerging, and that will encapsulate a plan to 2050 with a longer 50-year vision and framework. More importantly, it develops a concept of more equal sharing of responsibility for delivery within <coughs> Cornwall Council and with our communities. And I think this is timely given the declaration of a climate emergency, the current work that's going on to achieve environmental growth, our thinking about inclusive economic growth, the circular economy, the implications of digitisation, and of course our ageing population, and what about the economic shocks that uh, might be heading our way from Brexit? Sorry to mention that word. <laughs> now, various policy documents and strategies are under development. Uh, there's our local industrial strategy. There's the climate change plan. There's inclusive growth principles to deliver the government's shared prosperity fund. <coughs> and there's a refresh of our health and wellbeing strategy. And understanding how all these fit together and can support each other is going to be crucial. I'd like to talk with you about building with nature standards that Cornwall Council are developing the Cornwall Wildlife Trust, but I'm afraid I've not got the time. So I, I would encourage you to search for building with nature online to find out what that's about. So, neighbourhood development plans. How can communities use them to respond to the climate emergency? Well, on the Cornwall Council website, there are toolkits giving information about what neighbourhood development plans can do. And as a council, we'll provide information on things <coughs> such as, and so these are the things that you can use in terms of developing your neighbourhood development plans. There's information on biodiversity, energy efficiency and renewable energy, walking and cycling networks, flooding and drainage, planning for the environment at neighbourhood level, coastal change management, and we're in the process of preparing uh, guidance on green infrastructure. So neighbourhood plans can make local decisions about local development, and groups can therefore locate development to encourage walking, cycling, and sustain local facilities, and ensure that their things are accessible with public transport routes. Neighbourhood development plans can protect local services and facilities, resisting change of use, so that access to local services is maintained, reducing the need to travel and enabling local communities to remain sustainable. Neighbourhood development plans can protect multifunctional green infrastructure structure that can provide safe routes for walking and cycling, places for recreation and play, link wildlife corridors, enhance biodiversity, and make space for flood water. Neighbourhood development plans can safeguard areas for flood storage and increase resilience to flooding. There's guide notes on flooding and drainage that helps communities to incorporate measures in their plans to manage environmental risks and improve resilience to climate change. Neighbourhood development plans can include policies for coastal change management. And Cornwall Council guide notes on energy efficiency and renewable energy encourages a community-led approach to encourage and incentivise higher standards of energy efficiency. Neighbourhood development plans can allocate sites for renewable energy and support schemes that benefit the local community. So, in the Danish tale of the Emperor's New Clothes, it was a child that had the courage to tell the truth that the adults were scared to say. I watched a Swedish child, Greta Thunberg, speak on climate change, and she's equally plain speaking and honest. And she challenged me and all other politicians, local, national and international, to take climate change seriously. She cannot understand why our newspaper headlines and bulletins all over news outlets are not shouting about the crisis. In her 
her mind, there's no grey areas when it comes to our survival. And she went on to say that climate change is an existential threat and the most important issue of all. And yet they, and there she's referring to us adults, particularly us as politicians, just carry on like before. Well, I'm guessing that we're all here because we don't want to carry on as before. So I'm going to sit down and make way for some experts and inspiring speakers that will guide us in how to get out of this mess. Thank you very much.